Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, on this week's show, I'll be chatting all things fitness and health for all ages and how to stay active in your 50s and your 60s. I'm delighted to be joined by fitness expert and personal trainer, Jacqueline Hooten, who specializes in promoting active aging and avoiding physical decline in midlife. I started following her on Instagram, oh, I'd say about two or three months ago now. I've been so impressed by the content she's been posting in terms of health, in terms of wellness, and in terms of exercise. It's been absolutely inspirational. So we had to have her on the podcast to find out more and have a really good chat. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. How's it going? Thank you very much. All good, thank you. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> so I, I, so I know you from following you on Instagram, uh, and I've been really impressed by the kind of stuff that you've been posting. Tell our listeners a little bit more about you uh, and about, about, how, about fitness and you know how you got into it. Um, Okay, so I'm 58 now. I've got five children and two grandchildren. And as you've said, I'm very much about promoting active aging. But obviously, I haven't always been this age. So my sort of fitness, my interest in fitness has evolved and changed as as I've got older. So I've always been interested in health and well being. Um, Many moons ago, when I had my first son, who's 31 now, um, I was into pre and postnatal exercise and fitness, and I, I um, delivered post antenatal and postnatal classes. Um, and I guess so. My interest has always been around female health, empowering women with education to make informed choices. Um, and as in each phase of my life, so as I've got older, children have got older, my priorities have changed. My interest in fitness has evolved with that, if you like. Um, so to kind of bring you up to date now, because I'm 58 myself, I'm very much about promoting what we can do sort of in the menopause to postmenopause years to promote our health for longevity, because it's not just about um, living longer, but it's about living longer and in as healthy a way as we can. Um, so that's probably, um, and I've got loads more I can say, but in this kind of nutshell, perhaps that gives you a little bit where I am at the moment. Um, um, talk to me about why Instagram? Why, why post everything on Instagram? Why set up, set up the account and put all the, post all the content that you do? Was that an easy decision to make? Uh, yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, I think when it comes to any sort of social media marketing, the best place to be is, well, one, where your customers are likely to be hanging out, but two, on the platform that most suits you. And I'm quite a visual person. I think if you've probably seen all my beach images and all the rest of it, I personally like a bit of amateur photography. I think imagery speaks well. I'm very comfortable on video. And it's just the platform that I feel most comfortable on. It isn't necessarily where all my customers are. But I'm, you know, I am having said that because I'm on Instagram, I'm reaching people all across the world, which was particularly important in the pandemic when all of us had to pivot and put everything online. So now my business has kind of changed a bit because I've got clients from around the world, whereas pre-pandemic, it was very much more local based. But I really like Instagram as a medium of communication, actually. Um, I prefer that than other social media platforms, but other platforms work well for other people. It's just I really like the visual content of Instagram. I like how it keeps evolving and changing. Um, and it enables me to reach people from when, wherever. And I like that visual impact. And I think so many people, when it comes to fitness, they want to see like how to do the fitness. So it's a good way of showing them this is what it looks like and this is what you could do and exercise alternatives, as well as those sort of static, more visual images um, and sort of carousel posts where it might be a how to do it. This is a list of things, um, along with some of the kind of hard hitting stuff I put out about female health. And female empowerment, which is very much is part of that, I think. And let's chat about, I suppose, aging and health and aging and, and exercise. Like one of the things I love about your own account is the fact that, you know, you're promoting resistance training, all of that type of exercise for people, making it really simple. Because it's probably fair to say, as we get older, people and women in, in, as well, obviously, do less and less exercise. And they may do some cardiovascular, like walking or swimming. But even the thought of doing a weight workout or resistance workout tends to scare people. And, that, and yet... That's the thing we need to do the most in terms of, you know, pre-menopause and post-menopause in terms of osteoporosis and arthritis risks and all that lovely stuff. Resistance exercise is so important to do, yet so few people do it. Exactly, exactly. And so what I so we know, uh, so Public Health England here is asking healthy adults to make sure they're engaged in two strength training sessions a week. 
So in, first, in terms of cardiovascular exercise, we want to accumulate 150 minutes of moderate exercise. But in terms of strength training to promote our bone health, to retain strength and function, so daily movements, being able to put something up into a cupboard, being able to step on a step ladder and a step back again, even get things like getting in and out of the bath. And a lot of things that we kind of associate with the, an old person can't do that. Actually, someone older can do that if we retain the use and the strength in our bodies and unfortunately we do lose muscle mass with each decade so if we're not actively doing things to promote retention of strength and function we will lose it so that use it or lose it is really really clear um, but also we've got to counter not so much with younger women I think because my daughters are in their 20s and younger women are really kind of understanding strength training now when I first joined the fitness industry um, it was like I was the only woman using weights in the weight section. Now, when I'm in the weight section, it's really encouraging to see some younger women using it. But women of my generation, on the whole, have not grown up around strength training and weights. And so many women of my age and older are, are quite reticent around that. And there are some misconceptions we need to deal with. Some, some of it is a worry about um, getting hurt or you know, an injury. Um, they think it's not for them. They think they might become a bit muscular. They don't want to look a certain way. Um, and they just, they find it a bit intimidating. So what I try and do is break down people's barriers around that and show them actually how you can achieve that even from a home setting um, with minimal equipment to promote that muscular strength um, and endurance and avoid things like sarcopenia, which is um, loss of uh, strength as we're getting older and some of those things that we associate with old age and how we can kind of uh, avoid that. There's no guarantees, of course, so anyone can have uh, develop a, a cancer or an underlying condition. But what we're trying to do is to maximize our chances and reduce risks. And also to enjoy life, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I live a full and active life now. Um, and many of the women I, I work with, um, have seen perhaps older relatives or parents or grandparents and they've seen them go into decline and it frightens them. And here's me telling them, here's the alternative. Here's what we can do to reduce the risk of that and to still enjoy all the things you enjoy now in your 40s and 50s or early 60s and continue to enjoy those things in your 70s and 80s. You know, whether that's playing with the grandchildren or walking on the beach or going for long hikes um, or being, you know, having holidays, you know, being able to get on off, off an aircraft when we're all allowed to fly somewhere again. Um, all those things just to enjoy life and, and not to feel like you know, we, we need to change the narrative that people think ageing is sitting in a chair and doing less and less and aches and pains are to be expected and you know, we need to challenge that narrative. And when we see the possibility of how things could be different, then we then, and understand the action we need to take, we're with half a chance of promoting that healthy aging. Sorry, I'm probably going on a bit, but I, you know, you're, you've got me on the thing that I love talking about. Listen, <laughs> And that's exactly why we have you here. It's wonderful to bring guests on who can talk, which is, for, you know, in terms of, you know, whatever your passion is, uh, it's a great platform to be able to talk about it. So for, it's fantastic. It's great. So chat me through that and chat our listeners through that in terms of if they're listening in thinking, you know what, I'm too old to exercise. Mm -hmm. I'm too unfit to exercise mm -hmm. in terms of resistance training. Uh, I'm too, you know, I don't know what to mm -hmm. do. I don't know where to begin. I'm going to make a fool of myself, whatever. People have all those excuses. Bring us through that process with maybe some simple tips to get them started, how they can get started and things they should look out for. OK, so the first thing I would say, you're never too old. You're never too old and you've never got too many underlying medical conditions or injuries or anything that will stop you doing this. So there's always a level that we can engage everybody on. And that's, again, something I try to promote and share is this is the, uh, uh, one of the recent posts I put up is, OK, so this is how you can do cardiovascular training, even if you have a knee injury. So we can always work around that. So I think the first thing is to understand and challenge that idea that you might be too old because we know that we can make improvements at any age we know that scientifically we've got that evidence to back that up we know that we can get stronger at any age as well and again when they measure this and research it scientifically they can see that how they can make older adults improve their muscle mass and strength and function so we know that that's possible so that's the first thing is to challenge that thinking that you're too old and i think the second thing is to understand 
yes, fine, you may have an injury, you may have an issue um, as you're getting older. But again, exercise is going to be about preventing injury for the most part. So far from causing injury, it's actually because we're stronger, we're making those joints and muscles uh, better, if you like, improving the integrity of the joints and so on. So we can offset the risk of injury. And we, and if you already have an injury, not only can we think about injury rehabilitation to get you moving better, uh, but we can still work around things. So say you've already had a couple of surgeries and there's limitations because of that. We can work around that. So I'd always advise someone to get some some specialised coaching first of all. So you know whatever time because all of us our time is precious isn't it so whatever time we dedicate to exercise we want to know that we're getting the very best for that time so in terms of cardiovascular health very often a starting point for people is say you know can you walk 10 minutes from your home and 10 minutes back again and can you do that every day and most people given that like can you walk you know provided there's not real mobility issues they might go yeah i can walk for 10 minutes in one direction walk back again brilliant for most people that's going to be a mile if they if they're achieving that in a week they're going to achieve their cardiovascular prescription in terms of cardiovascular health if they're walking at a brisk pace in terms of strength training very often start with things like stand to sit from a chair so without using your hands so we're starting to work the lower body and we're just using the strength of the legs and we literally get people to stand, to go from sitting to standing and do that 10 times uh, you know, for a couple of sets of 10 repetitions and maybe do that all on alternate days. Then we might introduce things like light resistance bands, um, even things like through lockdown, because um, most of my people I were working with didn't have and, and new people that were coming to me couldn't buy weights. You, even if you wanted to buy weights you couldn't buy them everywhere sold out so people were using household implements like you know baked bean cans um, washing ba laundry baskets with some books in anything to add a bit of weight that's all we're doing and I guess it's also to understand when we come to when we think about resistance training why we do it it was by loading the muscles and the joints making them move something that's a little bit heavier so we make that muscle stronger because it has to overcome the weight so if you think about lifting something up from the floor the, the, all the muscles involved in that have to get a little bit stronger because you're having to lift it and over time that makes the muscles in very simple terms that makes the muscles stronger that makes the joints stronger so that's kind of where i would start um and you know so is but you can use body weight for many things as well so you don't necessarily have to invest in weights um, and it's just doing things that just feel a little bit challenging to begin with and as i say you don't even have to go into a gym resistance bands are a pretty good option for many people starting at home great and menopause has been a topic on in ireland and certainly on the podcast here in the last couple of weeks and months where it's been so uh, popular to talk about it which is brilliant for pre and post menopause it exercise is really really important and just tell us a little bit around why people should be looking at, at exercise and resistance exercise you know pre during and post menopause yeah absolutely absolutely so the peri to post menopause years so let's first of all let's be really clear about so menopause the average age of menopause is 51 but we can be going through perimenopause the lead up to menopause up to 10 years before that and also, of course, many women will experience an early menopause. So in terms of looking at the symptoms, that could be starting in the early 40s. Um, and so we might be starting to feel it isn't. And it's also really important to understand this isn't just the end of our reproductive years. The hormones that affect reproduction also affect every system in the body and our brain health and our heart health and our bone health. So it's because these hormones are fluctuating and reducing that we, we I think we've, just, we've touched on bone health very briefly, but uh, bone health can be um, ma massively decreased in the first few years following menopause. So one of the things we can do to promote bone health is to load the bones through resistance training, through strength training, which promotes our bone density, basically. And one of the problems with that, you think, well, what's the problem with you've got you know, bone density? What does that mean? Well, one of the real problems of that is developing osteoporosis. And osteoporosis is a, a, a condition where the bones are weakened. And the problem with that is many women may have a trip or a fall and then they break their wrist or they break an arm. And it's the very first time they may be aware or they may get told they have osteoporosis, which is quite a frightening thing to hear. Um, 
and many women will have a fall very surprisingly falls start to happen in your 50s so again if we're working on strength and thinking about balance and coordination we're, we're learning how to balance better which comes very naturally to us as children we bounce around all over the place and we recover and we nearly fall off something and we don't and we recover again uh, but as adults a tiny thing like, Whoa, well that's it we've become lost it completely so if we include that sort of training then if you know and so that which helps to the balance issue but also helps like if we do fall in terms of that bone health promote that so it's really important for the bone health what many people also don't realize is the cardiovascular risk so Prior to menopause, our cardiovascular sort of heart attack risks are um, lower than men. So we don't sort of traditionally associate women as having heart attacks. But actually, post-menopause, our risk of heart conditions increases and, and it reaches the same level as men. So we need to be doing things to promote our heart health. And if we think about the heart as a muscle, which it is one of the most important muscles in our body, we need to be challenging our heart, working our heart so it's efficient. When it pumps blood, it's working efficiently. Um, for every time that heart pumps, it's sending a lot of blood around the system. So we have a lower, lower resting heart rate, so fit an efficient muscle. And we can do that by doing cardiovascular training. And then that's going to be more protective when we start to, our heart disease risk starts to increase post-menopause. Um, so those are the, the key things really to be thinking about. So, so bone health and our heart health balance, cognitive health as well. And there's a lot of new information around cognitive health and understanding that, you know, many of the things that we're going through menopause, it is not just a condition that it's not just about the, you know, the ovaries and our reproductive health. It's a neurological changes as well. So things like the hot flashes, um, the anxiety, the sort of depression that might be associated with that, the brain fog, dementia. We know all these things. They're showing stronger and stronger links to what changes are happening in the brain around the peri to post menopause years. So in terms of our training, we want cognitive challenges in there as well. But we also need to be really aware of what's going on in terms of our diet and alcohol and so on. To do, it's the whole package. And for many people, this is everything that we kind of already know in terms of nutrition, uh, but it's time to get really serious about some of these things. You know, it's no, it's never, it never was about getting in a, a size, I don't know, a skinny size pair of jeans for women. But our emphasis should always and really, really at this point be about health, health, health. What is going to promote our health and our longevity so that... Sorry, I know I'm going on a bit, but the last, what we know in the UK is it, that the life expectancy for women is about 83, 84, but healthy life expectancy is 64. Now, I find that quite a shocking figure because that means for many women, the last 15 to 20 years of their life is spent in deteriorating health. So that means the average woman at the age of 64 will start experiencing deteriorating health which means the quality of her life, the way she enjoys her life will be impacted bit by bit. And that's what we're really trying to do is narrow that gap. Life expectancy, fantastic, it's 84. What we want to do is make sure that healthy life expectancy is more or less the same thing, that we're not just kind of slipping off and becoming perhaps sicker, but also more dependent. You know, so many of us don't can't imagine that idea of having to be dependent on other people. Um, and that, you know, that's a real issue. And, and of course, as part of that healthy aging, you know, we've looked at resistance. We pretty briefly talked around food, about eating for health, and what can make you healthier, and, and having a balanced approach, which is really important. Flexibility is another aspect of health that we need to ensure we're getting enough of as we get older. Yeah, absolutely. So that that making sure we've got a good range of movement and mobility through our entire body, um, and, and flexibility within the joints. And that's all part of a well, good, well-rounded training program as well. Um, and that's, you know, for people who are like pursuing things like yoga and Pilates, that can be absolutely fantastic. But you don't have to be a yogi to kind of work on flexibility and mobility. And many people will know this themselves. They'll think, oh, I can't tie, I can't reach my, I mean, the worst thing, I can't imagine this, not being able to reach your own toenails to cut your nails. But of course, that's a real, real issue for many people. So we want to retain mobility and movement for those daily, really simple functions that are part of caring for ourselves. 
alongside all the other things, you know, being able to put our arm back to put a jacket on, for example, being able to reach overhead to put something in a in a high cupboard, or you know, for women, if we've still got hair, being able to brush our hair. I know when I have this conversation with guys, they, they often say, oh, "I haven't got that problem," <laughs> but nevertheless, there are going to be plenty of things that you're going to be able to want to reach overhead for. Um, putting your shoes on, all these. I'm talking in really kind of basic things that hopefully people identify with because when sometimes when you see fle say flexibility especially nowadays people think of these outlandish yoga poses and they think well i'm never going to do that and, but that's not really what we're talking about we're talking about maintaining a range of movement within your joints that allow you to function um, really well and of course we're all being affected by gravity so you know all being pulled downwards a bit so we're all getting slightly rounded shoulders and everyone has spent the entire pandemic probably on uh, you know, so on, on computers, basically, and laptops. And so we're going to have a lot of postural issues and lower back problems. So being flexible can also help with some of these aches and pains that we associate with age as well, sort of feeling tight around the neck and the shoulders. Back pain, really, really common issue. Um, and many people will know themselves, they'll feel tight around their hamstrings. They tend to spend a lot of time sitting down, for example, they say the legs feel tight, the hips feel tight. So that's probably some of the things people might identify with listening to this. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. We're chatting all things healthy aging with Jacqueline Hooten. Jacqueline, let's chat motivation then. The final thing i got to ask you, some really simple tips for people who struggle with motivation or who kind of, you know, are sometimes motivated, sometimes demotivated, struggle to stay on top and stay on track. Do you have any tips for them? Yeah, so I would always say don't rely on motivation. Motivation is a fickle friend. You know, it may be the thing that gets us started. There may be something, an incident or something that makes us think, right, that's it, I'm going to do it. But we can't rely on motivation to keep us going. So when I work with people and everything I put on about social media is really about embedding healthy habits, which is coming back to that thing where I talked about, you know, can you go for a walk 10 minutes from your home and back again? Could you start, if there's someone not doing anything at all, I'd say, could you do that every other day? So we start really simple by embedding some health supporting habits like this. So it's not, you know, immediately changing your entire diet overnight you know, dropping everything that you currently it might be introducing. And also I like to think about instead of taking things away, like if someone's not eating any fruit and vegetables, for example, we might say, could you eat an apple? Oh, I don't know. Well, could you eat half an apple every other day? Or oh, I'm prepared to try that. I'm talking really simple terms now, but hopefully, you know, people would understand that. So it really isn't about motivation. It's about finding habits that you can sustain and build them into your life bit by bit. I think the other thing that goes with that is come back to think about your why, your the key goals that you have, and to keep revisiting that. So if I find someone's motivation, for want of a better word, is, is waning, we go back to, is that goal still important to you? You know, if someone has said to me, I've seen my father in a nursing home, I don't want to end up like that, I realise I need to address it, I'm really disturbed by what I'm seeing, and going, okay, is that still important to you? Do you still want to avoid that sort of downward spiral? Yes, I do. Okay. So, and when we come back to that, why we're doing it again, then bit by bit, we can't keep reinforcing why this is important. And as I say, the key to that is to go gently and slowly. I find the kind of the quickest way to drop out of this is to have ridiculous expectations too high at the beginning and think, right, I'm not doing any exercise at the moment. I'm going to exercise every day and I'm going to clean up my diet and I'm going to do this. And then it just becomes unattainable. And then people get demotivated and they think, see, I knew it wasn't for me in the first place. So it's just gradually bit by bit. So I would, I would say the key to that is embedding healthy habits and start off gently and start off with what feels achievable and very often if someone says to me well I'm going to exercise every day I said I don't want you to do that and they're really quite what do you mean I want to do that and I don't want, I don't want you to do it I want we're going to do this program and we're going to do it three times a week well actually two times a week for a couple of weeks well I think I can do more I don't want you to when I know that they've done it for a couple of weeks and they're champing at the bit to do another session that's a different matter. That's what I find works better for people because if you're trying to change something, you're putting something into someone's life, it's got to be achievable. They've got to feel that they can do it. Jacqueline, it's been great to catch up. If people want to follow you on Instagram, where can they find you? Um, they can find me at Her Garden Gym. So Her Garden Gym, and they'll find lots of videos and things for beginners right the way through to more experience. They'll find lots of different tips 
um, exercise videos, but also me talking to camera. And I quite often have guests on to talk about key issues that affect women in midlife and beyond. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And I really enjoy catching up with you too. Folks, that's it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. As ever, you know where we are, realhealth at independent.ie, at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram. If you liked what you listened to, don't forget to rate and review. And we'll see you next week for more Real Health. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.